I thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, and um, thank you so much to the law school and to Kosky and Minsky for giving me the privilege of participating in this conference and giving this lecture tonight. In listening to the lineup of prior speakers, I am even more honored than I was uh, before I came here tonight. It's quite an impressive lineup and I, I thank you very much for the honor. Um, I'm also very pleased to be here in Canada. You know, those of us who do labor law in the United States, I think have some kind of envy towards your system, um, various aspects of your system. I mean, obviously there's a lot of similarity, but yet there are significant differences. One little anecdote is um, I was asked to testify at a budget hearing this past year and one of the Republican congressmen asked me a question and he didn't specifically say Canada but I knew what he was driving at. He said are you going to do something to the like these quick snap elections and I said I'm not familiar with that term but as he explained it it was clear that he was talking about the fact that in Canada, unions can get an election pretty quickly as opposed to our American system. Um, I'm also quite intrigued by the, the uh, title of tomorrow's conference, Fault Lines and Border Lines. Um, fault Lines seems to be particularly apt for what I'm going to talk about, so I'm looking forward to um, to learning at tomorrow's conference. Um, and last, with respect to border lines, I would say that given what just happened in, uh, in London with Caterpillar, uh, my fear, I guess, is that America continues to export um, some, some of its best questionable, question some of its best practices north. So with that, let me just say that I think it is impossible to have a candid discussion about American labor law and policy today, let alone a discussion about the original promise of the Wagner Act enacted in 1935. It's impossible to have that candid discussion divorced from the escalating and overheated political storms of the last few years in the United States, and particularly that of the last 12 months. Um, Bernie Fishbein may not remember this, but we met in the fall and at a, at a business conference uh, we were both attending and he said, don't talk too much about American politics. People get glaze over if you talk about filibusters and things like that. But I have to apologize because I think it's virtually impossible to have this discussion about labor law today without getting at least a little bit into American politics, which has, since we met, I think gotten curious, curiouser and curiouser. So this law um, has been, since its enactment, um, probably one of the most controversial, if not the most controversial piece of New Deal legislation. It has been said that um, the reality of labor management relations is largely a battlefield and related to that that the NLRB in order to enforce and administer this law must referee a holy war. You get the terminology, a holy war, a battlefield. Um, when it was first enacted in 1935, this law, the Wagner Act, was clearly viewed as one of the most dramatic legislative innovations of the decade. It was enacted with the express purpose of achieving common justice and economic advance. Those were President Franklin Roosevelt's words when he signed the Wagner Act into law. Common justice and economic advance. Uh, and it was enacted for the explicit purpose of trying to help the nation return to prosperity. This was uh, deep during the Depression. And earlier measures to help alleviate the economic condition had not really worked. The law was groundbreaking in seeking to regulate a whole arena of social life, namely the relation between business and its employees. And it was one of the first pieces of New Deal legislation to be upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. It ushered in a 20th century vision of national power to regulate business under the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. After enactment, things changed, if not easily. After great struggles, collective bargaining became an established part of American economic life. 
and the greatest period of, unions gro of union growth in the US history then ensued. Over the next few decades, millions of American voters um, American workers voted for union representation and NLRB conducted elections and millions achieved a middle-class way of life through collective bargaining and agreements that provided fair wages and benefits in major industries of the economy. This was truly the golden age of collective bargaining and as Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman has written once upon a time back when America had a strong middle class. It also had a strong union movement. These two facts were connected. By the mid-1970s, however, the long but steady process of decline and disenchantment with the law and with the federal agency that administers it had begun. For decades, the scholarly literature has been full of words like death, dying, moribund, ossification, uh, 1983, Harvard law professor and Canadian Paul Weiler wrote that American labor law more and more resembles an elegant tombstone for a dying institution. That was already 1983. So the law had already started to look like a doomed legal dinosaur. Uh, and for years, labor law has been relegated in the United States to the margins of our public policy discourse. It's the NLRB has been a backwater, referred to as a little-known federal agency, but nonetheless a lightning rod. Today, 76 years after the enactment of this law, which was intended to equalize bargaining power between workers and their employers, organized labor as a proportion of the private sector has steadily declined since the 1950s and is now at an historic low. And wage inequality as at, is at a record high, higher, at higher levels than we've seen since the first Gilded Age. The last significant revision to this law was in 1947 at the end of the Second World War, more than 60 years ago. And the most recent attempt to modify the law, the Employee Free Choice Act, stalled in Congress. Most seem to agree that this law is outdated and warrants a renewed conversation. But beyond that, there is no consensus. Its relevance to contemporary economic reality is in serious doubt. Um, in October 2010, on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the Wagner Act, Richard Freeman, Harvard econ labor economist, said, and I quote, it is perhaps harsh and impolitic at the NLRA's 75th birthday to declare that in 2010 the law no longer fits American economic reality and has become an anachronism irrelevant for most workers and firms. But that is the case. Today, however, I think we are in the midst not just of a battle for the continued relevance of labor law, but rather an existential struggle, something that Bernie Fishbane alluded to. We are witnessing a battle over the very existence and legitimacy of labor law and collective bargaining rights. This is being fought in Wisconsin, Ohio, Indiana, and other states, on Capitol Hill, and on the presidential campaign trail. It is certainly, it is uncertain where this is all heading and how the battle will end. Um, but with its overheated rhetoric, uh, the struggle is certainly part of the larger political battlefield and seems not likely to su subside, at least during this year or presidential election year. Uh, the, last, the last battle being the ongoing recall campaign of Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker. Paradoxically, I think all of this just might lead to a renewal of labor law and policy. But one thing certainly seems clear to me is that labor law still matters. And the noise and the controversy attest to that. Notwithstanding this escalating controversy and other challenges that I will mention that have persistently plagued the NLRB, uh, notwithstanding all of that, the fundamental values of this law still endure. I'm going to examine this escalating controversy, particularly some of the rhetoric and the reaction to what the NLRB has done in the last year and a half or so, uh, and then outline what I see are the enduring values. 
So a starting point for this really, I think, is um, captured by what American historian Richard Hofstadter wrote in 1964 during an earlier political period of turmoil. And he, he wrote an article entitled The Paranoid Style in American Politics. And he wrote, American politics has often been an arena for angry minds, an arena for angry minds. Certainly in today's political battleground, epithets have replaced argument, opponents are vilified, and compromise has become almost impossible on the most pressing national issues. Social conflict is not something to be mediated or compromised. What is necessary is not compromise, but the will to fight things out to the finish. Total elimination of the enemy, rule or ruin, as President Abraham Lincoln once said, rule or ruin. And I think there's no better illustration of this state of affairs than the fight over national labor law and policy, labor law and policy. Uh, and I think American labor law today is an arena for angry minds. Um, the board is no stranger to controversy. Um, this battle has been exceptional, but it is not unprecedented. Uh, in 1939, an economist wrote a book about the early travails of the National Labor Relations Board entitled Unions of Their Own Choosing. And he talked about the fact that from the beginning, the critics of the NLRB had accused it of being nothing more than an organizing agent for trade unionism. Um, he said, put somewhat less bluntly, it is said that in administering the act, the board is partial to unions and biased against the employer. That's something we a refrain we've heard a lot in the last year. He talked about the fact that the practice of anti-unionism is deeply rooted in American industrial society uh, and that after 1901 the National Association of Manufacturers assumed the leadership of organized anti-unionism and he concluded any inclination to underestimate the power and influence of this opposition should be dispelled by the success with which the policies and actions of the board have been misrepresented. I think you could say that again today. The first chairman of the NLRB, Chairman Madden, uh, was accused of being biased towards unions. Uh, and at the end of his first term, President Roosevelt decided not to reappoint him. He waited, I think, until after the 1940, 1940, 1940 election had passed uh, and then nominated him to a court. He was confirmed to that court, but not before Senator Taft uh, engaged in over four hours of, uh, I guess you would call it filibuster on the Senate floor, saying that Madden had no judi judicial temperament whatsoever and that he had perpetrated a gross perversion of justice while chair of the NLRB. So as I said, none of this is unprecedented. But even for an institution that was created out of struggle, often violent, uh, and an institution well accustomed to controversy, this has been an exceptional period and exceptionally rancorous. Um, the accelerating con controversy, I think you could, if you had an instrument to measure it, you would see that almost month by month over the last two or three years, the controversy has accelerated. Um, what we've seen, I think, over the last couple, three years is a record accumulation of difficulties. I like to start with September 2007. That was towards the end of the Bush NLRB. In September that year, the board issued 60-some divided decisions, every one of them divided on party lines. The labor movement entitled those decisions the September Massacre. It led to demonstrations outside of our headquarters and congressional scrutiny in December of that year. Um, and then at the end of 2007, the board went down to two members already mentioned. Uh, this, I think, was probably the most obvious legacy of the Bush era and the controversy both within the board and about the board. Um, the Democrats were by then in the majority in, in the Senate. Uh, and decided not to go into recess at all during President Bush's last year in office so that recess appointments could not be made not only to the NLRB but to any other 
agency of government or the courts. Uh, President Bush made three nominations, but they just sat in the Senate. Um, as Bernie mentioned, my then colleague Peter Schomburg and I somehow managed, despite all odds, the issue about 600 decisions where we came together. We were a two-member board for 27 months. Um, it was amazing to anyone who knew us because there was almost nothing that we agreed on. Um, but somehow we managed, um, and on the theory that no good deed goes unpunished, the Supreme Court did hold in June 2010 that this two-member board was not a lawful quorum. Um, about, by the way, about 120 cases came back to us um, so those had to be redecided but then of course uh, President Obama was elected and um, the Employee Free Choice Act was introduced into the Congress by then the nation was in an economic crisis uh, and the controversy continued to escalate little by little the Employee Free Choice Act was not a legislative priority um, that was that position was taken for the health care legislation um, and meanwhile both sides spent enormous amount of t time and money trying to convince the public and Congress of their positions with respect to this Employee Free Choice Act. President Obama made three nominations to fill the vacancies and one of them, Craig Becker, became extremely controversial. His nomination really was swept up in the battle over the Employee Free Choice Act. Craig Becker had started life as an academic and therefore had a paper trail uh, and the business community had an intense um, opposition to Craig Becker. His nomination was actually filibustered and in uh, April 2010, President Obama finally made recess appointments. He recess appointed the two Democratic nominees, but not the Republican. That only further escalated the controversy. Um, and in Je June of that year, the Republicans in Congress told the President that unless um, they confirmed the Republican and the non-controversial Democrat, they would not act on any other nominations that the President had made. So um, for about two months, the board actually had a full five-member complement. Um, continuing controversy in November 2010, of course, we had an election in the House of Representatives went uh, majority Republican. And when they came to town in January, uh, their full scrutiny was turned among other agencies, but particularly to the NLRB. And since January 2011, there has been almost nonstop congressional oversight, bat battles over the budget, huge firestorm over the uh, issuance of a complaint against the Boeing company uh, with um, um, subpoenas to the general counsel, threats of contempt if, he did, if the general counsel didn't show up at a hearing to be held in South Carolina. Um, further controversy created by an, a rulemaking the board did about its election rules. Uh, then my term ended last August. The board went down to three members. Uh, there was public uh, cry that the Republicans should resign because that would bring the board back to two. As we know now from the Supreme Court, a two-member board can't issue decisions. And the Republican member of the board did not resign at first, but threatened to resign in the fall if the board can continued to pursue a rulemaking to uh, improve its election pr procedures. That ended up in a huge controversy, although in the end the Republican member did not resign. Uh, in January of this year, the board went down to two members again when the recess appointment of the aforementioned Craig Becker ended. Uh, at this point, I should say the Republicans had said that the Republicans in the House of Representatives, who have no role in confirmations, had said that they would not agree to any recess of the Congress so that the President couldn't make recess appointments. Little did we know that our Constitution has a provision that says for the Congress to go into a recess of more than three days, there needs to be the agreement of both houses. Nonetheless, President Obama did make recess appointments in January and 
there is ongoing litigation challenging whether those were legitimate appointments. So I mention all of this, maybe getting too much into the weeds of American politics, but just to show you what I mean by a record accumulation of difficulties. One thing after another after another with the rhetoric and the reaction to everything going on continuing to escalate. Just an example of the rhetoric. Um, I think it could be captured by what um, candidate uh, Governor Mitt Romney said when uh, the president made three recess appointments to the board. He said the three appointees were union stooges. Um, notwithstanding the fact that one of them was the former chief counsel of Mitt Romney's labor advisor and a Republican, but that's okay. Union stooges. Um, this is the level of our political discourse at the moment. Um, shortly, r right before the Obama board was constituted in April 2010, uh, one management consulting firm put out a, a I guess, a call for business saying um, a, the radical NLRB is going to destroy corporate America. Um, after the Boeing complaint issued, which I had nothing to do with, that was the agency's general counsel, I got something in the mail that said, withdraw the Boeing complaint, you partisan progressive Marxist moron. <laughs> um, I said union stooges. Did I mention socialist goons? Um, South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley said that the NLRB is absolutely an un-American rogue agency with a bully mentality. Uh, Marxism on the march. Uh, when I issued a concurring decision suggesting that the framework for analyzing whether a company should share information with the union before it relocates part of its facility, um, the reaction was Leon Trotsky would be cheering today's NLRB. Um, when a Georgia congressman proposed defunding the agency entirely, he said this New Deal relic wasn't necessary anymore. Uh, congressman Joe Wilson, some of you may remember during one of President Obama's State of the Union addresses, when a congressman screamed, you lie. Well, that was Representative Joe Wilson. He said the NLRB is turning union states into roach motels. Um, but clearly the biggest theme about the rhetoric is that uh, American business is being regulated to death by government, but particularly by the NLRB. Uh, this is a constant theme. Last fall, I actually Googled the words job killing and NLRB, and I got 767,000 hits. Um, so without getting into the larger debate, let me just say that um, collapses on Wall Street mine explosions in West Virginia and oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico don't suggest to me at least the need for less regulation. And can anyone really think that the NLRB has the ability to kill jobs? Beyond the rhetoric uh, has been what I would call the battle to distract, to delegitimize, de uh, to change the subject of the conversation. So as I mentioned, the board has been under constant scrutiny from the Congress. There have been repeated oversight hearings conducted. Uh, there was a budget battle, an, an amendment which sought to defund the agency entirely. One uh, 176 congressmen voted to defund the agency entirely. That was a majority of the majority. Uh, South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham introduced something he called the Stop the Madness Amendment, which would prohibit agency spending on the Boeing case. Uh, there have been other pieces of legislation introduced to amend the statute to basically undo everything the NLRB did um, during my tenure as chairman. And um, there's also a bill introduced by South Carolina Congressman Trey Gowdy, which would abolish the NLRB entirely, uh, send its election functions to the Department of Labor, and send its unfair labor practice authority to the Justice Department. And Senator Lindsey Graham and others have announced that they will not let any board nominee, any nominee to the board be confirmed, and that would be an improvement, he said. Uh, I've mentioned already the recess appointment issue and the fact that that is being challenged. So that's been the reaction. I think there have been 24 bills introduced in Congress to try to 
change the statute to prohibit the board from doing what it's done or to weaken um, its already pretty weak remedial power. Um, I think there's also a proposed amendment which would remove the board's jurisdiction over small business, and that's the vast majority of businesses in the United States. So what's the record? What is the actual record? What actually happened um, that triggered this kind of rhetoric and this kind of fierce reaction? So in a nutshell, we issued new decisions in about 120 cases that came back from the Supreme Court. Uh, we decided maybe 100 cases that had been languishing at the board for years because they involved novel or difficult issues. Um, we did two rulemakings, very unusual for the NLRB, which has historically just done adjudication. We did one rulemaking, which would require for the first time the posting of a notice in private sector workplaces advising workers of what their rights are under the statute. The statute is practically the only American workplace statute that does not require a notice posting. Um, coincidentally, when I arrived here today, I found that the district court in Washington, D.C. had issued a decision uh, on a challenge filed by the National Association of Manufacturers uh, challenging the authority of the NLRB to issue this rule. And the court decided that the board had the authority to issue the rule, but did not have the authority to require, uh, with penalties, that employers put up the, the poster. So the, the rule had said that it would be an unfair labor practice if an employer refused to post the notice after being asked to put it up. Uh, and it also would toll the statute of limitations for uh, charges, filing of unfair labor practice charges if the post notice hadn't been posted. The court seems to have said, and I haven't studied it closely, that these things might be done in an individual case, but the board had no authority to do it as a matter of rulemaking. As someone said to me earlier today, this is kind of classic NLRB, rights without remedies. Um, the board, as I mentioned, oh, I should say that rulemaking was done with notice and comment. We got 7,000 co comments that were dealt with before the final rule was issued last August. Then we did a separate rulemaking, a pretty comprehensive rulemaking, to try to make our election procedures work a little bit better. This was not the Employee Free Choice Act, as uh, some in the business community uh, alleged. This was just trying to look for inefficiencies in the procedures, parts of the procedures that weren't, necessi weren't necessary and caused delay. Uh, we got 62,000 public comments uh, in that rulemaking. The final rule issued in December after my tenure was up. And we issued a number of other decisions, a couple of which have been mentioned already. Um, are any of these things radical or the end of capitalism as we know it? Obviously, you know where I stand. I think each of these things uh, was modest but meaningful. Modest but meaningful. The board by itself is not able to effectuate any kind of radical or dramatic change. Only Congress can do that. So basically I think what the board did was what I heard Teddy Roosevelt said to his, to his troops when he wanted them to take San Juan Hill and they complained they needed more ammunition and more troops and everything. He said to them, do what you can where you are with what you have. And I think that's what we did. We did what we could where we were with what we had. Um, it was, I think, a productive period. Uh, from the time the Obama board was constituted until my tenure, uh, ex until my term expired, we had about 15 months. It was a, a busy period. I think that we rigorously enforce the law, but with respect for the law, for the rule of law, and for legal precedent. Um, I think we paid careful attention to transparency and public participation in the decision making. We sought briefing in a number of cases where we were thinking about changing the law. Um, and we did that at some risk to inciting controversy because as soon as we sought briefing, uh, we were hauled up, or we weren't literally hauled up to Capitol Hill, but the Congress uh, conducted oversight hearings 
just over the fact that we had sought briefing in cases and sought to get us to produce documents about ongoing cases. And we also did in terms of transparency, public participation, these two rulemaking proceedings um, with notice, public notice and comment. Very unusual for the NLRB. I also think that we exhibited a willingness to take carefully considered steps to keep the law vital and we exhibited a concern with the real world needs and consequences. Um, I think to us the law is dynamic, not static. Um, is this the most activist board in decades, as some have said? I don't think so. I think we were very active, but again, modest but meaningful changes. I think there's been an enormous amount of overheated rhetoric and misrepresentation. Certainly the Boeing case which the board itself was not involved in, uh, was probably the largest trigger of the controversy. Um, contrary to allegations, President Obama had absolutely nothing to do with the issuance of the Boeing complaint. This was not a payback to unions who supported him. In fact, I would suspect that President Obama would just assume this complaint not have been issued because it became something of a political liability for him. And it also has nothing to do with an attack on right to work states. Just so happens the Boeing plant in question was being built in South Carolina. Um, but it could have been built in Pennsylvania and the same complaint allegations could have been made. So, given what I think is the disconnect between the reaction, the rhetoric, and the actual record, what's going on? I think the reaction, the rhetoric cannot be explained by what the board has done will do or can do. And I think there's several explanations. First of all, it's as Monty Python once said, I'm not dead yet. Um, the agency, so one of the uh, opposition organizations said what has us worried is the agency has been neutered for so long that we're worried about what they're going to do. So I think the fact that the, I've analogized to the patient waking up in the hospital bed and wiggling its toes, the agency probably had been neutered for a long time and it woke up and started to do things. I think that got people nervous and contributed to fear mongering. That's number one. Number two, Clearly this controversy is driven by politics, particularly the presidential election politics. Um, there is, I think, a clear coordinated strategy to weaken labor because of their ties with the Democratic Party and their influence really out of proportion with their size um, because of their people power and the ability to get people out to the polls to vote. Um, and I think it is part of a co coordinated strategy not only to weaken unions, particularly public sector unions, but also to uh, attack certain voting demographics through so-called voter uh, fraud legislation in cases. Um, so this is, I think, part of a coordinated strategy, um, which is very, very political. But the, I think the controversy also reflects a profound divide in the United States over these issues that surfaces from time to time. And this time the divisions are no doubt exacerbated by the economic crisis, which has created fiscal constraints, which has led to partisan arguments against worker rights and finger pointing at, at teachers, at firefighters, etc., and inflamed the societal conflict, exposing deep, deep national fault lines. Um, probably the labor fault lines are as deep as any as you could find on the domestic policy side. Um, and at, at bottom, I think this is really a war over government um, and the role of government. There's a deep divide in our country over the way Americans view government, those who view it as a social good and those who view government as the enemy. Um, there are plenty in our society who have never accepted the New Deal laws in the first place uh, or the, Im the, the, um, the era of national power that the New Deal laws ushered in. And this, I recently read this, I thought it was quite interesting. In 1947, of course, the Wagner Act was amended by the Taft-Hartley Amendments. It was enacted over President Truman's veto. 
uh, one of the co-sponsors was Fred Hartley. In 1948, he wrote a book about this, and he said, it is my sincere hope that the Taft-Hartley Act will point the way for the Republican Party to approach its overall problem of reducing the size and cost of government. Once we accept the concept of the Taft-Hartley Act as a model to begin an interim period leading to complete elimination of the governmental labor relations agencies, we can apply that concept to other areas of government activity. Very telling, I think, uh, 1948. So fundamentally, I think what we are dealing with is a values-driven conflict, social, political, moral values that inform our laws and our policies and our debates about them. And what I'm talking about is not simply differences of opinion, but rather differences that arise from asymmetrical moral worldviews or diverging social realities, including, I think, competing views of both the present and history. Um, I would suggest that the Occupy and Tea Party uh, movements have put all of this into a stark relief. Um, interestingly, in March 2009, right after the Employee Free Choice Act was reintroduced into the Congress, a very interesting political column was in the Washington Post. And the, um, the author said, he was writing about the Employee Free Choice Act, which he said seemed destined to be a relatively narrow clash between unions and employers. This is 2009. But amid the economic downturn, it is turning into a debate over fundamental questions of American capitalism. The environment in which the bill is being debated has further ratcheted up the rhetoric, revealing a divide as wide as on, on any other major issue in President Obama's agenda. The two sides put forth starkly different versions of both history and present day reality, making it hard to imagine how the two sides could compromise quite prescient, I think, absolutely, that's what happened. So I've outlined for you this persistent controversy, nothing new, but certainly exceptional over the last year or, or so. Um, but this is just one of, I think, a whole series of persistent challenges that had plagued labor law and this board almost from the beginning. And let me um, quickly, I guess I'm really running out of time here, but quickly tell you what I, I see as the persistent challenges. Um, there's a deep divide over the view of this law. The, there are those who see this law as critical to a democracy and a sustainable economic recovery. They think unions are important to help workers negotiate labor markets and balancing the power of business. Uh, and government, in their view, should help with this. They bemoan the fact that the law is so ineffective. It's hard to convince them that the, the law really works. On the other side, there are those who think that this act is a relic of an earlier era, um, that collective bargaining exacerbates joblessness and doesn't fit in a com competitive free market economy, and that the law is no longer essential because workers have a whole array of other legal protections. To them, unions are an impediment to the operation of markets, and they think that government should seek to limit the extent and power of trade unions, which they view as some kind of cartel. Um, for these people, the NLRB has never had their confidence. There's also, I think, a real disagreement about what the underlying purpose of the statute is today. The 1947 Taft-Hartley amendments uh, introduce language into the statute which protects the right of workers to refrain from union activities and to deal with their employers individually. This freedom of choice is sometimes in tension with the overriding policy of the act, in my view, which is in the express language of the Wagner Act, which says that it's the stated purpose to promote collective bargaining. Some people believe that the statute is now at war with itself because it has irreconcilable purposes and it makes it very hard for the board trying to figure out how to administer the act with these irreconcilable purposes. We also face the challenge of trying to enforce a law that has not been amended since, as I said, 1947. And law professor Jim Brudney, in a very interesting article that he wrote called Gathering Moss, about the resistance of this statute to legislative change. He, I think, pointed it out quite vividly. He said that Congress has made no changes in this law 
unlike many other statutory regimes. The Congress has made no changes in this law since Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball, since television arrived in American homes, and since well before the creation of the interstate highway system. I think that, that tells it as vividly as I could. As a result of the failure to update the law, we face the problem of trying to apply it coherently in a very, very changed social and economic environment. And even this issue has become the subject of controversy. There are those who say that the law is basically static and only um, Congress can update it. And there are those, myself and others, who think the law is dynamic. It should be a, a living law. You particularly see these issues coming up with uh, issues of who's covered by the law as employment relationships have changed so dramatically as a result of a competitive economy that has forced employers to seek flexibility instead of stable uh, employment relationships. So that's another source of persistent challenge and controversy. And the last thing I would mention in terms of a persistent challenge is the increasing lack of familiarity with this law with the contribution that the law made to our economy, the contribution it makes to a democracy, um, the role that trade unions have played in our society. And I look particularly at young people in the workplace, um, both workers and their employers, who don't know that much. You look at the fact that um, labor law is not taken by that many students anymore, that the judiciary itself is less and less familiar with issues arising under this law which protects collective as opposed to individual rights protected by so many other workplace statutes. Um, this was part of the reason why I wanted to do, do this notice posting rulemaking for whatever modest impact it might have to educate workers in the workplace. Now perhaps the events of the last year and all the controversy with the Boeing case and what's gone on in Wisconsin and with the labor disputes in football and, and other sports. Perhaps maybe this has done something to raise awareness. I think you would have had to have been almost half asleep over um, the last year not to have at least heard the words collective bargaining. So perhaps um, if the controversy continues, people will not only know the words collective bargaining, but maybe they'll even have a reinvigorated understanding of what it's all about. Um, and, and let me close very quickly. I'm just going to borrow a few minutes to say that notwithstanding all these persistent challenges, I do think the values of this statute endure. Um, it's like dinosaur DNA, there is value in this statute. And the, and the enduring values that I would identify would be, first of all, the rule of law, the system of governance that this law introduced to resolve disputes over the desire by employees to have representation at work. Before this law was enacted, these disputes went unresolved for years and they were often very violent. The enactment of this law totally changed the way disputes over representation were resolved. Second would be the freedom of association that this law protects. The right of working people to come together at the workplace and have a voice in the workplace. Um, this statute embodies the progressive era notion that industrial democracy is basic to a political democracy. Uh, and this relates to the important role of an independent trade union movement in a democratic society, particularly as a counterweight to the political influence of corporations. The third enduring value would relate to what I mentioned earlier, what President Roosevelt said when he signed this law, um, that it was necessary as a matter of common justice and economic advance. This law was specifically enacted to restore the nation to prosperity by allowing workers to engage in collective bargaining with their employers. The notion was that through this collective bargaining, their purchasing, workers' purchasing power would be improved, and through their purchasing power being improved, the nation would be restored to pr prosperity. So economic advance through equality of bargaining power is another enduring value. And of course, related to that is the opportunity through collective bargaining for labor and business to come together not only to distribute wealth, but also to come up with their own solutions in response to changing economic circumstances. The opportunity to manage change, the, man the opportunity to innovate, and the opportunity to create wealth. And that leads to the fourth enduring value, which I would mention, 
which is the private system of workplace governance and dispute resolution that has arisen under the statute. We don't have in the U.S. a system of government mandates. Instead, labor and business, at least in a unionized workplace, work out their own solutions through collective bargaining. And the systems of dispute resolution that have been negotiated and put in place provide a measure of order to countless workplaces. I think perhaps this may be the, the, the most obvious legacy of this statute. The, the processes for dispute resolution that have arisen and been used not only in other employment contexts but in other settings as well. All of these values are of course interconnected. They all relate to fairness, they all relate to social stability, they all relate to the economic health of the nation. Um, without any one of them, I don't think we would, see, we would have seen the social stability that we have seen over the last seven decades. Um, restoring all of the promise to this law, I don't think that's a panacea for our problems, but it's probably a good start. Um, I think there's some careful cause for optimism. Um, there's always the law of unintended consequences. And um, there's a New Yorker article this week about Governor Scott Walker and whether um, what he's done may backfire. And it quotes one of the, the Wisconsin protesters who said, um, Governor Walker created a generation of activists. We will be his undoing. Uh, and in Ohio, when the voters um, voted in the last election to undo the rollbacks to collective bargaining in the public sector, the New York Times quoted one Republican strategist unnamed, but he said, this really is a core value, and the bill was out of step with that value. Um, so I don't know where this is all headed. Um, Harley Chaikin, the industrial relations scholar, said it's not clear whether it's D-Day or Dunkirk. Um, but we shall see. Um, but that, I think, in a nutshell, is uh, where we are today. Some may be uh, cautious ground for optimism. Again, I thank you so much for having me here. I'm sorry for running over my time.